Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built. And in this episode, we are continuing to work on bits and pieces on Harry. All right, well, uh, thanks for joining me again for another episode on Harry. And if you are enjoying my 911 videos and the series on this car and my other crazy projects, please think about subscribing. It would really help us out. We are within hopefully a few days of 100,000 subscribers. It is a, it's a really exciting uh, milestone just uh, to finally get there and uh, that, that you guys are actually watching is, a, is, is really great. So um, anyway, getting back onto Harry, uh, as you can see, Harry is filthy. Uh, I've been driving Harry quite a bit. Uh, it's been my sort of semi-daily driver, uh, as long as it hasn't been too hot, because uh, Harry doesn't have any air con. Uh, otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll uh, take Archie. But um, it's been really good. Now, I started uh, last week, you saw me going through and doing the cruise control. So I thought, first of all, I'd take you through and just show you a little bit of the setup on the Link ECU and just show you how sort of simple it is to actually get this thing all running. Okay, so I know this is not the best view of the screen, but basically it is really simple to set up. The Link ECU is really easy. I just went to my list of digital inputs and I had the wire, digital input seven. I just click on the digital input seven, brings up the window. I just select the, uh, the function it currently has out of the list of functions that are on the, uh, the list here. And this particular one, cruise resume. So I just click cruise resume. And I've actually set up now a, an on off switch as well, uh, off camera. And you can see there, if I switch the cruise control on off switch, it's, uh, it's all working. And then if I go through my stalk settings, I have my stalk active switches there and also set up on my brake is oil the brake switch is all working so all of my inputs it's it's quite simple to uh, to set it up and under the chassis and body i've gone to cruise control set my minimum speed lockout 20 kilometers an hour max is 160 kilometers an hour so it will only work in between those two speeds i've left all the other parameters as they are and that's that's it that's quite simple now i haven't had a good chance to check it out yet but all of my inputs are all set up so that's the cruise inputs all set up and ready to function. And actually I've uh, tested out the Hall effect sensor I set up on those wheel bolts last episode. And uh, it works great. Just by enabling it in the, the Link ECU, the current readout it's giving me with just out touching any of the settings um, happens to be only about 10% above the actual speed I'm traveling. So I've been using the GPS speedo and the GPS speedo saying I'm doing 60 kilometers an hour. The, um, the ECU is actually uh, reading 66 kilometers an hour. So it's about 10% above what I'm doing. That should be a simple calibration in the uh, uh, ECU. So that's a great, uh, a great little win there. So the next thing to look at is my speedo. And um, actually one of the viewers, Roland, thank you very much. Um, actually reached out, he's a uh, machinist, and he said he could fix this tiny little speedo drive because this is no longer available from Porsche. And uh, basically what, what had happened is there's a little tiny ring land here, and this ring land had broken off. So what he did is he went through and, uh, and TIG welded it back together and then machined it on the lathe, much better than I could do to uh, repair this. I still got to file down a little, uh, little lip there, just, I'll just do that by hand, because uh, this little flat we've worked out is actually to let the oil through to the seal. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Roland. Um, next time I have the engine out, I will, uh, I will put this back into the gearbox just to make it complete. I've also had a lot of people commenting about the, uh, the gauges in this car while they're on an angle. Um, basically, with these uh, Momo Pro Prototipo wheels, steering wheels, uh, they look really good. They're really uh, a nice look for this uh, era car. But unfortunately, they are too small. I believe they made some that were larger, um, you know, many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, which are no longer available. And these are, even though everybody runs them, they're too small for this car and they block the gauges. And another thing I've noted is actually because I've been driving this car a little bit lately and I've actually taken it on some spirited runs, it, uh, it drives great, sounds amazing. Um, but I find that the, the wheel being smaller there's less leverage and it feels like with no power steering on some of these bumpy roads, it does feel like it's, um, I just don't have quite as much control. A slightly bigger steering wheel would give me that little bit more leverage, a little bit more control on the, uh, um, through the, uh, the bumpier sections. And uh, I think I would be comfortable with a bigger steering wheel. So I'm on the lookout for something a bit bigger 
that uh, will uh, still suit us. I love the style of this wheel. I think it looks fantastic, but it's not very practical. All right, the next one is a fun one that I've been looking forward to. Um, I am getting Harry ready for his first track day. Hopefully it's in a couple of weeks, but that's uh, all due to some uh, border restrictions and stuff. Uh, it may actually be a little bit longer than that, but either way, we need to uh, get him ready. I'm going to be taking Harry on the track, at least. As you know, we've got the Rockster. This is going to be the track car, but this is still going to, uh, you know, when I go on road trips and stuff like that, when I'm, when I'm out and about, I do still want to get uh, Harry out on track and, uh, and have a bit of fun. And actually, Raceworks parent company, uh, Premier Auto Trade, have a new brand, which is uh, MVP, Motorsport Vehicle Preparation, and they have sent me out some really cool six-point harnesses for Harry in purple, because um, you all know that I love my purple interior. So uh, we are going to go through and fit these now. These should be a, um, a nice addition for the track. So uh, let's start fitting the, uh, the rears, threading the rears on and uh, the sides, and I'll show you how we're going to go about doing all that. Okay, so I've set the harnesses up. I've uh, I sat in the car and worked out roughly where I want the shoulder parts to be on the uh, uh, on the harness. Now these need to be parallel or lower than your shoulders, which these are in this car. Um, that's the way I built the roll cage so that it, my shoulders sit about here. So the uh, the harness bar is in the right spot. Now the, to uh, to thread them. Basically, I've, uh, I've just looped them under, over, and, uh, and back over again. This will go through and tuck back into this side, and then the excess I'll just gather up once I've got the uh, adjustments just right. Now, for the lap belts that go through the side of the seat, on the end of them, uh, Raceworks supply it with, either a, with a clip and with this uh, eye bolt. And uh, what I've actually already done is you can go through, it's the same thread, as the uh, the factory seatbelt bolt, so you can actually just thread them into the seatbelt bolt spot and uh, and clip on the side. So that makes it nice and easy. All right, the sides are in and bolted up. The middle is the same through the uh, the bolts that hold the seatbelt in. I've just got the eye bolts and the uh, harness hooks onto the eye bolts, which replace the bolts that hold in the uh, the centre. And for the uh, the center of the seat you have the uh, this is a six point harness so you've got these two leg straps that come up from underneath and if i move my padding out of the way you can see on this particular sparco seat um, what i was going to do is uh, put the harnesses through drill holes in the floor and actually use these mvp plates so these plates are actually got the uh, the nut captive into it and you can just drill a hole in the floor and then bolt these in from underneath and that is uh, structurally complies with uh, the the regulations for the for the harnesses but on this particular seat i've just realized that because this is a um, a sparco seat with the uh, the the frame made for a 911 it actually has a harness bar underneath the seat already so i just need to wrap my harnesses around this uh, solid bar and uh, the uh, seat should be set up. I just need to adjust and get everything to fit just right. All right, my harness is all installed, so I can just basically clip it all in. And the benefit of this harness, it's all FIA compliant, so uh, that's good, and it's a six point. One. That's perfect, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, so basically what this is, it's a, uh, it's a six point harness, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, from my research, basically what you you either want to have a five or six point harness if you're going to put a harness in a car. Four point harnesses and uh, are, are not a good thing. 
um, my understanding of it is, is because these arms are all fixed, in an accident they're not going to move. So um, the issue is, is that if you, if you don't have the crutch strap, you can submarine and actually slide under the harness and uh, into the footwell of the car, which is not a good, uh, a good thing. So you need that sort of uh, support and having the two um, supports down here just can give the boys a little bit of room. So if you do have an accident, hopefully they dig in either side and don't actually uh, do as much damage as they could potentially do. Now, the difference is with a, um, you might ask, why is a three-point harness, this basic regular seatbelt, okay? And the, the reason why these are good is because when you do go in an accident, you lean forward, which can, it will lock the, uh, the spool from the top and pulls the waist strap tight so you won't uh, submarine. So it's actually very simple and a, uh, a very effective seatbelt, which is why they are, you know, in every single vehicle around. Um, I'm really happy with this. I have harnesses now. Um, nice and secure in the car. I'll do the uh, passenger seat and then we can move on to the next job. All right, the next thing I'm going to have to tackle, again, for the getting to the racetrack, is I've got a fire extinguisher that I've been, it's been rolling around in the floor of this car uh, ever since I built it. I don't want to run one of these old cars without a fire extinguisher. Um, maybe I should even look at getting a plumbed in one into the engine bay, just with how much money I've spent on that uh, engine. And having a an actual fitted fire extinguisher that actually, it actually mounted into the car is a huge plus. And uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to actually design up a mount to fit this fire extinguisher into the car um, using the factory seat rails. So this will, even though I've got these seats in, it'll actually, um, it would actually still fit if I swap back in and put the factory seats in. Um, because I'm gonna actually make this so that if any of you guys want to get the exact same mount, you can. That's the plan. So uh, anyway, let's uh, start working out a plan on how I'm gonna actually fit this to the car. All right, and there is my bracket. So that uh, that will bolt onto the factory uh, seat bolt mounts, and uh, it's nice and nice and rigid because of the uh, the fold in it. And that is where I'm going to bolt on my fire extinguisher mount. So I'll have a nice mount that sit down low underneath the uh, the uh, the seat. It should be <clears throat> should be perfect for uh, for the car. So I'm going to give it a quick coat of paint now, and then uh, we'll fit it to the car. Okay, bracket is all bolted up. Uh, that looks like it's gonna sit quite nicely in the car, so now I need to just bolt it into the car and we'll be done. Okay, so the fire extinguisher bracket is mounted in the car and it's uh, looking pretty good. And I've actually been talking with uh, Russell Cap, who is one of the longtime subscribers who uh, watches us regularly, and um, he actually makes fire extinguisher brackets and he hasn't made any for um, the uh, old 911 yet, but he's got it for the, already from the 996, the Boxsters, uh, WRXs, full drive, all sorts of cars that are simple brackets that basically uh, just, you know, you just unbolt the front seat mount, seat bolts, bolt the bracket on, and it's a quick, simple thing. And they're all nice and neat and tidy and powder coated and stuff. And they're pretty cheap. Uh, it ships everywhere in the real world. So, so if any of you guys want a fire extinguisher bracket because you want to do track days and things like that um, anywhere, um, check out 
uh, his site. I'll put a link uh, down here and uh, it'd be uh, cat.industry slash home built by Jeff. And um, that will help me out. I get a, um, um, uh, a small commission from all the sales and, uh, and it also helps out the rest of you guys. It's a good little product and as I said, if you can build it yourself, get out there. It's a simple project to build, build but if you um, just want something nice and neat to uh, bolt straight in the car, they're there as well. So um, yeah, make sure you go through my link and um, yeah, check out the fire extinguisher brackets. All right, well, the oil is all drained out now, so uh, the next thing to do is to actually start removing all the coil packs, and then I've got to remove the rocker covers. I've got myself a uh, service kit, so um, I'm gonna start at the top, because the bottom should hopefully be a little bit easier to get to the, uh, um, the rocker covers, so let's start taking out coil packs, taking out rocker covers, and see what we can see. So you can see in here, the uh, top valve covers are off on both sides. So it's time to get the car up in the air and take the bottom ones off. So the valve covers are off and everything is looking nice and clean in there, which is, um, which I sort of would hope, seeing as it's, uh, this engine's probably got a thousand kilometers on it, maybe. Okay, so now let's uh, pull the spark plugs and have a quick look. Okay, so obviously this car being a twin plug engine has 12 spark plugs. These, for example, are what the plugs look like coming out of cylinder one. So um, I'm not an expert. They do look like they've got a fair bit of soot on them, but the tips are sort of uh, this sort of light brown in color. Um, to me, it looks like it's burning reasonably clean, but probably is a little bit rich. I am far from an expert on reading spark plugs, but I have noticed that they all look about like that, except for these two, which are out of cylinder three. And these two are extra black all over, uh, very black and sooty. So something with the, the tune on cylinder three is not quite right. So that's uh, something I might look into a bit further. Now the plugs are out, the covers are off. We need to do the valve lash, but I can't do that on a warm engine. I actually drove it this morning to uh, obviously warm all the uh, oil up for doing the oil change. So I'm gonna leave it overnight and I'll see you again in the morning. All right, it is the next morning and it's time to get in now and start checking the valve lash. And to do that, uh, the, the easiest way, you need a feeler gauge. Um, it's worth getting yourself one of these little, uh, these little tools. You can find them, check it out, Porsche Parts by Jeff. Dot com, you'll be able to find uh, these, I'm sure. And uh, basically, this is made so it's much easier to be able to get it down in and get it into uh, between the, uh, the, the the lifter and the valve, uh, the top of the valve stem. You can uh, you can get these in there. And this is about 0.1 of a millimeter. You want it, to, which is about four thou. So to start with, I've got the engine at top dead center. So you can see I've got the Z1 mark there in line with the little mark on the fan housing and uh, do that just by putting a, uh, a 24 mil socket on the end here and turning the fan around and that helps drive the uh, pulley around to get it up to top dead center. And now we can start work on cylinder number one, which is this cylinder just here, the uh, one closest to the rear of the car on the left hand side. So to check the, uh, the, the lash, basically you want to try and get the feeler gauge while it's at top dead center on this cylinder number one, get this feeler, the feeler gauge in underneath the valve and uh, that's got a nice little uh, amount of drag on it. That feels just right, and actually the top feels good as well, so I'm happy with that valve lash. But to actually adjust it, what I need to do is uh, I need to loosen this 13 mil nut and tighten or loosen the, uh, the screw head on the top here. That will uh, tighten or loosen the valve and then lock it down again with the 13 mil nut and then recheck. Um, but uh, this particular one I am happy with, so uh, Let's move on, turn the engine over at 120 degrees and then do cylinder six, which is on the opposite corner of the engine. 
So I've gone around now and I've turned my crank around 120 degrees. You can see the uh, the logo there is sort of one third of the way around the, uh, the rotation instead of being at the top. So uh, that is now ready for us to move over to the back cylinder on this side, or I should say front cylinder, closest to the front of the car. That's cylinder number six, because it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six is how the, uh, the numbering goes. All right, I've gone through, I've uh, adjusted all the valves. A couple of them were a little bit looser than I would have liked. I've just sort of tightened them all up. I'm gonna go through now once again. Now I've gone through once. I'm just gonna go through and check all of the valves uh, a second time before I put it all back together again, make sure everything is perfect, and then we can uh, start reassembly. All right, valve lash is all done. Um, yeah, it's a bit of work getting in there, but um, now it's done, there's a peace of mind. Um, just because the engine's so fresh, things have settled, so now it should be good for another you know, 10,000 Ks or something like that, I'm not sure. I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head of uh, when, how often you're supposed to check them, but uh, yeah, it's not a bad idea. And I just got a, uh, a gasket kit um, to sort it all out. It's got all the hardware for the uh, rocket covers to put them all back on again and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to put in new gaskets just to make sure we clean up all the surfaces, make them all sure they're all ready to go, and then uh, we'll bolt it all back together. All right, oil is topped back up again. Um, everything is bolted up. I've gone through and double checked to make sure I hopefully have done everything right. Uh, I'm always nervous at this point, it's, but it's the uh, moment of truth. See if it will actually start again, if I've done it all properly and it all works. Sounds good. All right, well, um, I just took Harry out for a drive. Um, there's a bit of oil. I'm hoping it's what I sort of spilt when I was filling it, um, but there is a bit of oil burning on the exhaust on this side, which, um, yeah, fingers crossed, I haven't got uh, one of those uh, leaky rocker covers because I put new gaskets in it. I made sure the surfaces were clean, so it shouldn't be that. It should be just the, uh, the leaking oil. Uh, we will soon find out. Um, I will monitor that over the next couple of days, but we are done. So um, make sure that you, uh, if you're interested in a fire extinguisher bracket, um, check out uh, Cap Industry slash Home Built by Jeff. And if you need any parts for your Porsches, make sure you ch compare prices first at PorschePartsByJeff.com. All right, guys, do all the usual stuff, like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one. See you guys.